And today we're going to talk about managing facilities and assets through Enterprise GIS. So uh, Enterprise GIS program, you'll he hear me throw around those words. I'll probably shorten it and just call it the program as we go through the slides. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Maser Consulting is an ESRI uh, partner, Silver partner. So a lot of the applications we're looking at today, actually all of them are either ESRI based or uh, based off of one of ESRI's partners for asset management solutions. So this agenda today, we're going to talk about the, the basic components of an enterprise GIS program. Uh, we'll go through the uh, successful steps that we take to implement such programs. We'll take a look at the risks that are associated with some of these programs that we implement, how uh, eGIS management programs are used at Maser by our professional engineers and surveyors, uh, and how our clients use the applications that we implement. At the end, we'll revisit those risks and how we mitigate uh, those issues, and uh, then we get to our questions and answers. So the basic framework for a GIS program uh, is pretty much made up of these four components. So we have people that utilize the system, we have data that we create or that's provided by clients or other associations, and then you have procedures that are being used within the program. And then sometimes there's required deliverables. It could be regulation-based. So I have examples of, of these uh, four parameters on the next couple of slides. So let's dive in. So people that utilize uh, GIS-based asset management programs uh, typically could be on the public side. So some of our customers like to make some of the data available that the public can consume. Uh, it could also be a utility company or energy company or a school district that has customers, people that come to their schools or utilize their utility. They want to have some of that information facing on the public side. And then you have uh, people that may be commuting into the region of your asset management program. So assets that you're managing, such as roadways or bus stops. And being able to allow a commuter to either log in or, or view a spatial map and learn about things such as where permit parking is, where the bus stops are, what somebody's zone is on a property, when school is open, and recently where COVID-19 uh, testing areas may be. So there's a lot of pu public consumption, the people that utilize these programs. Then we have our decision makers. The program is being implemented for maybe a school district or a municipality. And there's people that want to utilize the system to review overall assets and make decisions on operation and maintenance, capital projects. Agencies also utilize these programs. And what we see lately is a lot of these agencies are making data available for people to view in asset management programs, such as a Department of Environmental Protection, creating wetlands layers, making them available, and being able to add those into your web-based asset management program. And then consultants. On the energy side of our clients, there's many times where uh, energy companies may hire several consultants and they want to use the same platform for people that may be performing inspections in the field. Client wants to be able to see that information all in one standard format. And then you have your maintenance staff, people like police departments, people need to see what they're going to in the field. So maybe there's work orders or requests for service from the public and the maintenance person needs to take a look at that property, see if there's violations on it. And then your supervisor is wanting to be able to see a dashboard of uh, current conditions of your assets and facilities and making decisions that way. So you can see there's a vast variety of people that utilize these programs. On the data side, I've got a couple examples. We probably could have hundreds of slides on data examples. I'm sure all of you manage different assets in your daily activities. These are just a few examples. So some of the assets are underground. In this case, it's a water distribution line in Pender County. Uh, also aerials. 
they have parcel lines to be able to see where these assets are located. The data, as most of you know on this call, uh, with GIS has a robust database behind it. So some of those uh, database entries for this water line would be the type of water line it is, the size that it is, maybe when it was installed. Another example of data, and this is almost a, a cross use of data, uh, which we'll actually be talking about on our next mobile session on mobile and UAS LIDAR data fusion. Mike Ehrenhart will be doing a presentation on our next Mazer webcast, but this is a good example of that. Utilizing uh, an unmanned aerial craft, taking photos from vantage points that you would not be able to get uh, you know, on your feet and cross-relating those still images to points on the GIS map. So the pink points that you see on the left screen there uh, is the data, uh, the, the X and Y location of where all those photos are. So that's another example of a point database that you would have in your asset management program. Uh, some other things that uh, have been very active lately is the, the aging solar farms that we see and we're starting to uh, take that information and using it in GIS to be able to show panels that have some inefficiency such as uh, hot spots through our thermal imaging with UAS. So bringing that down as a data set in your GIS program and then managing those locations, you know, maybe cutting work orders against those and repair them. Uh, vegetation management too. So assets could be in the ground, they could be on the surface, they could be above ground. So those are just a few examples of data. So procedures, and I think this is one of the most common sections that we have to focus on when we're implementing a GIS asset management program is what procedures does the client want to move into an efficient management style in GIS? So it could be things like annual stormwater catch basin inspections. Maybe in the past, there was no real good way to keep that data organized. Maybe they just went out randomly and cleaned out the leaves and catch basins along certain streets every year. But that process can be made very efficient uh, when doing it in a GIS program. So that's a procedure that would be identified as being uh, more efficient if it was brought into an asset management program. And then the middle one, I know not all of you live in areas where there's snow, but even hurricanes, when sand comes up on streets, you can't find your assets. People have to go out, dig out fire hydrants, uh, try to locate the location of that. And with GIS, you can use GIS asset management programs to uh, pick the asset and be directed to where it is. So you can see in that center one, sometimes the fire hydrants are completely covered by snow. So uh, another good procedure that would work really well if you had your assets in an asset management program. And then clearing vegetation. So collecting that data that we just looked at on the other slide and then knowing where the vegetation is approaching clearance where uh, power lines overhead are being uh, compromised because of trees that are growing under them. And deliverables, this was the last part of our components for uh, the GIS asset management programs is uh, there's a variety of deliver deliverables and some of them are certain required formats and this example here was one of our clients during Hurricane Sandy in New Jersey. It's a, a Middletown Township Sewage Authority where uh, they used their asset management plan that they already had in place to track all of the repairs that were happening in their treatment plant facility and out on their collection system and all the assets in the field. So unfortunately their plant, their subfloor area, as you can see there was filled with water, but they were able to keep their GIS moving. It's web-based that we host for them and they were able to track all the information uh, of all the uh, equipment that was being repaired. And this particular report in the GIS program was groomed to FEMA's satisfaction to get reimbursables. 
Here's another example of a deliverable, though it's not a regulation. Uh, this was a dynamic a DOT straight line diagram that was created using Esri uh, applications. Uh, the image on the left, which uh, took me a little while to understand how to read that, but basically the straight line diagrams help you know where signage is and where intersections are. And by making it a dynamic map on the right, you can see it's much more efficient now. They can click on the actual sign and get directions to where it is instead of using that counter wheel in the field to get to the location where mile markers are supposed to be. So it's dynamic and they can make edits in the field. It gives a little bit more to the process of a straight line diagram. Instead of just being a record document, you can actually use it in the field and make edits to it. This deliverable is a is regulated. So this is a New Jersey State Division taxation tax map for the city of Elizabeth. And this deliverable has very strict guidelines on how the maps need to look. And this is one of the examples of it was a CAD, CAD based standards, and we were able to do this in Esri. And we're going to talk about this presentation on this this entire project at Esri's National User Web Conference that's coming up. So uh, if you're attending that, look for our presentation uh, to see how we did this whole project. So uh, another deliverable that actually has uh, a certain requirement that needs to be followed. So now let's switch over to uh, the recipe for success, I call it. So implementing a an EGIS management program uh, takes a lot of process. So in, in some cases, uh, a client may never have had a GIS program or they have data in various formats, paper maps, uh, digital maps, maybe some survey, some AutoCAD. So these are the steps that we typically take for it and I highly recommend the first step there, the needs assessment and the implementation plan. That's where we're able to communicate with the, our clients, especially if they're a new client, to help understand their processes and procedures and the organizational requirements they have. Looking at hardware and software they currently have uh, active and the people that would be using this program and the data that they have available. So as I'm stating, and I'm sure all of you are thinking about the assets that you manage, the data development piece is very important uh, to how you implement the program. So data needs to be standardized in a format so you can take on uh, the applications that an eGIS management program can offer. So when we looked at uh, the catch basin inspections or clearing of those hydrants, you really need to have some good base data like where those catch basins are or where those hydrants are located and have it in a common standard format. Then you have your implementation process. That's actually dialing up the program, training people, making sure it's functioning the way uh, that was suggested in your implementation plan. So the implementation plan is basically a roadmap to get you to the, your final goal. Operations and maintenance of the program as well. So it's not just a, dial it up, here it is, and walk away, it needs to be maintained. You need to track enhancements, hardware changes, software changes. As you can see, even with things like an iPhone, they're constantly changing, new, new uh, versions are coming out. So you definitely need to have a maintenance plan as well. So the risks that we see, I've been doing this a long time. I don't want to tell you how old I am, but over the years, uh, these are the, the typical risks that we've come across and, you know, lessons learned. Uh, we've learned how to mitigate those, which we'll talk about later. But these are the typicals, you know, uh, the commitment of a steering committee or a steering team. So those steering teams usually consist of your consultants, or your staff that's going to implement the program and some of the higher leaders, your stakeholders. Communication between the people that are implementing the program, the staff that you have that are the program leaders and just making sure that communication is open. A lot of people have fear of change. You have staff changes, people retiring, summer interns coming and going. 
people getting advancements in their career. Maybe they're not the data technician anymore, and now they're supervising a crew in the field. Maintaining the data, we see this a lot of times, kind of falls short. Not enough budget to maintain information goes by the wayside. The longer that happens, the less important the asset management program is because your data is not accurate. People start losing trust in the data that they're seeing in it. And then keeping up with upgrades, as I was talking about, hardware and software is constantly changing in the GIS world because we're using mobile devices in the field. Things are cloud-based now and just keeping up with all those changes. So let's talk about solutions. So we're about halfway through with the presentation now. Uh, I have a variety of solutions that we're going to talk about. The first couple are what what we call it Mazer, uh, we've branded them as Mazer's M3 Mobile Management. So with our partnership with Esri and our internal use of GIS to do for our professionals to perform the tasks that we've been speaking about, we've put together uh, using Esri's web maps and web apps criteria and standards to handle certain types of services that we provide to our clients. These M3 services are geared towards, uh, this particular one is geared towards environmental services. So using things like a collector for ArcGIS, Survey123, allowing you to create form-based applications in the field for inspection and dashboards as you see here in the photo shot. We can uh, have customized uh, the form-based inspection criteria for this type of client and type of job. Uh, they're able to access map overlays depending on the project, manage work tasks, the dashboard that you see there, they can, uh, the managers, the client, and uh, our managers in-house at Mazer can manage the project per project on the dashboard. People are able to add notes, pictures, important documents in the field, manage material use during their inspections, coordinate uh, the whole sign off for the inspectors, and then also monitor vegetation. So uh, this uh, mobile manager environmental services is geared for that type of service line. Another example of one of these is our real estate site analysis. So being able to satisfy a client that's looking at suitable properties. So these suitable properties could be land acquisitions, uh, easements, you know, maybe putting electrical in the ground as opposed to overhead wires. Uh, it could be site selections for solar fields. It could be site selections for warehousing or certain types of businesses, daycares, school locations. So our client typically is someone like a developer that would be using this application to uh, have their criteria set up by our staff, upload it into the system. We help them get set up with their Esri account and then they're able to attach notes, pictures, important documents. They can hit drop down lists. You see there on the one fly out button, it says potentially suitable. They're able to change that to maybe not suitable. Once they visit it in the field, they go in their car on their mobile app and they just switch it over to this site is not suitable. They can look at zoning. They can look at land use, property assessment, and then environmental constraints I talked earlier about map services that agencies are making available for asset management to, uh, programs to consume. So things like uh, wetlands and uh, habitat environments, being able to have those as overlays. And then dynamic uh, reporting at a site level or maybe multiple sites that you feel are suitable for maybe warehousing. And drive time analysis, so using business analyst of Esri, um, being able to look at your site and say, all right, well, how how far am I away from this site if I'm coming in on Interstate 295? So uh, just examples of, of how these applications can be groomed and management programs to suit a certain type of client and a certain type of uh, criteria. 
And then the uh, emergency management response, right? So COVID-19, I think everybody uh, has had, you know, a lot of trying times with all of the COVID-19 that's going on, but utilizing an asset management program to help your public know where resources are, uh, you know, having a web map as part of your asset management program, being able to track all of the FEMA reimbursables that happen in a town, you know, maybe signage like the COVID-19 testing site, or, you know, maybe there's been flooding and they need to track, you know, all the assets that have been buried and damaged because of water. So uh, again, this would be configured role-based security, people logging in and tracking certain things on their mobile devices and being able to report that out to FEMA. So those are the three examples of some of our uh, services that relate to mobile management that help our internal staff do their daily jobs and to help our clients uh, deploy their ESRI environments and uh, serve this information up for them as well. So let's talk a little bit about regulations. So uh, this is one regulation that uh, is out of the state of New Jersey and it's the Water Quality Accountability Act. So there was a uh, demand on this over the past year that people that owned water distribution systems had to had to locate their hydrants, their valves by GPS. They had to perform inspections on valves and hydrants at different intervals of the year, depending on the size of the valves and the hydrants needed to be flushed every year. They needed to store that information in all the inspection records. They had to be able to analyze that information and then be able to export that information into their asset uh, management plan to have it available to, to be viewed and reported on. So this is a perfect example of using your asset management program to handle a requirement that's being mandated to you. So for a water system, hydrant flushing, valve exercising, uh, we have deployed the dashboard for ESRI uh, to allow uh, map services to run for people in the field to go out and flush the hydrants. So the supervisors are assigning the work staff goes out and flushes the hydrants and they change color on the map as you go through. Quite simple, but we took a process that could be pretty trying for people. You see this particular client has, uh, in the upper left, you can see the total amount of hydrants flushed. There's uh, 1,600 hydrants in this uh, region. This is Mount Laurel Township MUA uh, out of uh, New Jersey. And um, it was a daunting task, but now they, it's at their fingertips on this dashboard. They can see how far along they are, far across the top shows the progress that they're doing throughout each uh, day, uh, exercising the hydrants, making sure they work. You can see that on the left in the middle, and then down in the bottom, bottom left are the blow-off flushing that they're doing as well. This is real time. Supervisors can look at this dashboard. It rolls everything together. And if they're interested on a certain asset, I don't know if you can see that on your screen, but right in the middle, there's a green hydrant that has a blue square around it. We're looking at the details on the right on that particular asset. Who was the operator? Who flushed it? Was there a problem? When was it done? Uh, when did they start doing it? And when was it, was it completed? So they are now able every year to report out this information. It's all in their asset management program. They have the correct map. They have all their hydrants mapped and uh, it's really saving them a lot of time uh, doing it this way through an asset management program. This is uh, a EGIS asset management program that's district wide. So this is a town where it's not just based on one asset, they're managing multiple things with their asset management program. So we see this a lot with municipalities, utility authorities, counties, states. So they have one operation where they can log in and look at everything that's happening in the town. So this is one of our partners, ViewWorks DTS out of Orlando, Florida. We've been partners with them since 2008. 
And we offer their solution to municipalities and authorities, typically. Uh, it suits them well. They're able to have a nice informative map on the right where they can click on and off different layers, look at that information, see their work orders in real time, work orders that are open or in green, ones that have been completed or gray, those are the upside down teardrops, and then if they're in a red-orange color, it means they're on hold. So the supervisor can see what's going on spatially. And it's very intuitive, easy to use. They don't need to uh, know how to use like a Esri software, a uh, desktop version. Everyone is able to see this through logging in, controlled access to certain layers and certain work processes, searching properties, block and lot, owner name. You also could search on uh, assets such as an electric pole or a, a light fixture that's along a road. So they're tracking all their work processes down to the asset level. The ViewWorks application allows public requests to come in, service calls, internal, external, work orders to be created, resource management, inventory, tracking your fleet, your equipment, your staff, people that are assigned to a work order. How much is a work order costing me? How many times have I gone to that asset? It's been a sewer blockage. And how many times have I been there? What's the condition of it? And what's the risk of failure? Taking all that information into account and rolling up capital project planning with that. So it's spatially related. This is a true 100% web-based asset management example here facilities as well. So I'm talking a lot about assets and facilities are assets as well. So having an asset that uh, would be a, a treatment plant of some sort, all these things may not be mapped, but you certainly can access them in your asset management plan simply by going to the, the room that the asset's in and clicking on, in this case, a feed line, a valve, and being able to look at the work orders associated with that valve. It could be safety inspections, standard documents, maybe the owner manual, and also being able to search to this data easily down in the lower right, clicking on a certain sta uh, pump station and going to that and looking at the pumps that are inside of there. And coupling that with our LIDAR static scanning uh, service line. So taking a uh, scanning of that and being able to pop open that scan and get measurements on height clearance and valve sizes and things of that nature. So asset management is the true product to bring all of those components together, the data that is collected and tracking all of the conditions of your assets. And one other uh, example here on condition and risk of failure of your assets, once they are all mapped and you're starting to do work orders against them and tracking the condition of that, all assets have different types of criteria. So the one on the left is pavement. So clicking on your intersection to intersection pavement line, you're out in the field and filling in the structural defects and the ride defects and rutting and coming up with an overall condition index on that pavement. Looking at it citywide and being able to see which streets are in uh, disrepair should be repaired first, first year, second year, and tying costs to that as well. And the view on the right is actually the uh, Philadelphia Navy Yard where we did some mobile LIDAR collection and they wanted to see areas that were within certain elevation ranges to see what assets and what streets were flooding. Uh, so the Navy Yard is very low elevation and uh, they are uh, under redevelopment right now for new use of the Navy Yard and they wanted to see where uh, flooding took place. So again, having all that stuff at your fingertips in your asset management program really goes a long way, very efficient for you. So the last couple slides here and then we'll get to the questions uh, and answer period. So let's revisit the risks, right? I talked about these, but I didn't say how we mitigate them. So here's some uh, things that we do for our clients uh, to mitigate uh, all those risks and to keep everybody in the know. So we may, maintaining our edge to serve our clients, what do we do to maintain that? 
right? I've been doing GIS for a long time. Since starting that, there's now masters in GIS. People come out of college with a uh, masters in GIS where that wasn't available when I was in college. So I attend a lot of technical conferences and I was obviously pick the brains of the people that work for me. Uh, we also do regional technology sessions. Uh, there's a screenshot there in the lower left is uh, Plainfield uh, Municipal Utility Authority. ViewWorks came out. We hosted their uh, user conference for the Northeast uh, two years ago. So the clients were able to all get together uh, that used that application. And we had technology breakouts. The clients shared their success stories. People were able to talk about some you know, issues they were having with their assets and how they were managing it in a, uh, their EGIS program. Then we also do monthly seminars and uh, talking about enhancements to the systems and helping uh, our clients with the hardware that they purchase and uh, installing the Esri apps on them and help training them and presenting uh, at conferences and talking about how clients are using asset management programs. There's a lot of similarity, although every program, uh, I have never seen any that are all uh, identical, but uh, when you're dealing with a certain type of asset, maybe it's a DOT that's dealing with their pavement, uh, they're all pretty much managing things similarly, uh, but their needs might be slightly different. So uh, being able to keep up with that and offer seminars like I'm doing right now for all of you. And then supporting our clients through training. So uh, at Mazer Consulting, we have uh, professional training centers at our offices, uh, at several of our offices, and we're able to train the end users, uh, office people, field people, we actually do train the trainer. So a lot of times we're delivering an asset management program that a client may have their own server and uh, you know, we're turning it over to them. We'll train them so they can train other staff and become accustomed to managing the system on their own and providing online training and support, especially with this COVID-19 time, we've been doing a lot of online training for our implementations of these programs. So I wanted to thank everybody for uh, joining us today. I hope you found it of interest and I'm definitely available to talk further on this uh, if you wanna reach out to me by email and then that's my work cell number there. And I'd like to take this time to turn, turn this back over to Maria Thorpe who's been handling the questions that are coming in and uh, hopefully I can answer them all and I'll try not to say it depends because I hear that a lot <laughs> when questions are asked. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, we have a few questions here. The first question is from Kevin. <clears throat> Excuse me. He asks, how does your team assist clients with implementing a facility asset management program for a treatment plant or university facilities like campus buildings and substations? Sure. So we uh, assist them. We'll come in. Uh, this is uh, so it's related to like implementing uh, the actual program. Uh, we will come in and do that assessment, uh, learn about the assets that they're looking to manage and take them through that implementation process, scope out the project and uh, start the implementation process by uh, gathering their data, migrating it to a standard and then meeting with them, training and then go through the process and procedures that will be implemented in the program. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here is from Jen, and the question is, do you have metrics on before and after implementation efficiency improvements? Sure. So uh, that's a good question. And a couple of years ago, we uh, kind of went out to some of our clients that were using their asset management program for several years to find out how efficiency levels had improved and on the response when somebody was calling in with an issue of an asset and being able to handle the actual maintenance of the asset and getting back to that person it, the improvement was around 27 30 percent uh quicker response times so we typically see somewhere around 30 percent improvement of efficiencies once uh 
once the system is up and running and assets are being managed within the programs? Good question. Okay, great. Uh, this question is from Rick, um, and he says, we are in the process of upgrading our water meters from touch read to radio read. How can these be tracked? So when we are reading meters, we do not have to touch certain homes to read the meter. Okay, so uh, there are some programs for these uh, meter readings that can tie into your asset management program, if I'm answering that correctly. So data that is getting generated could be tied in through web calls into your program and be able to see those meters and what the readings were. Uh, as for walking up to them, you still would need to if it's if, if it's not being uh, calculated digitally. Okay, great. Um, another question, um, this is from Pradna. Uh, she asked, I think this was when you were looking at the slide through the, um, you were looking at the asset management plan map from Tenderfly. She uh, wanted to know, uh, does it show the type of hydrant present and does the report go to the concerned municipality division if it needs repair? Yeah, so that would be an example of more than one uh, uh, owner uh, being involved with the data that's in a map. So if a municipality doesn't own the hydrant and uh, the inspection was done and they track the type of hydrant that it is and maybe it's rusted and they couldn't turn it, open it for flushing, the work order could be processed for that and be pushed to a certain entity. So maybe the town doesn't own it, but Maybe a, a utility company owns it, but it's in the jurisdiction of the of the municipality. So the work orders could be pushed to somebody outside of the organization. Okay, um, and this is an extension of that of that. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that that same that same person asks this um, additional question. Given the maintenance and upgrade of um, EGIS to EGIS programs. Have you ever had an occasion when your original project had to be redesigned because of this? And if yes, how do you cope up and how much extra time did it take? Sure. So uh, I immediately thought of some of our clients that implemented GIS before a lot of these new applications have come about. And for example, the water quality uh, dashboard that we were looking at, that hydrant data needed to follow a certain schema, a certain standard. So we have had clients that implemented 10 years ago before Esri released their standard schema uh, for utility models. So uh, sometimes we have to take a step back in order to implement some things that are off the shelf to get the standard uh, format of those data. So uh, an example for the hydrants to have that standard model put into that and pushed out to these applications that are off the shelf. And the time involved, it, I'm gonna say the word depends, <laughs> but uh, you don't know uh, the cost or the time effort for that because there could be thousands of hydrants as opposed to maybe 50. Okay, great. Um, there's another question here. Is there an available application for an iPad? Uh, we have many users which enter resources in the field. Yeah, so the Esri mobile applications and the M3 applications that we were showing uh, work on uh, iOS, Android, Windows. So yes, they can be deployed on those uh, devices you already have. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me see. I think there's one more. I apologize. It's okay. Um, let's see one more. Let's see. Somebody asked if you could talk about creating a work order and tracking it using GIS. Sure. So the off-the-shelf asset management overlays like ViewWorks or Cartograph or CityWorks, uh, those sit on top of the Esri platforms, Arc Server, Portal. Uh, 
So the work order process is a, a form is configured. Uh, you can also use uh, Survey123 for ESRI. You configure the form, and then you link that form to the asset. So a lot of times we see the work orders getting linked to properties, right? It's all based on an address, but it could also be based on a pull location. And once you click on that asset, you open the work order and it's linked to it. It's linked through SQL tables. And then you can report on those work orders. So if there's 10 of them on a certain property, you'd be able to go to that property and look at what's called the child database of all those work orders and be able to report on them or see the status of them. So typically the work order is linked to the actual asset and all the assets in your asset management program, whether it's a school building, a utility pole, they need to have a unique identifier of some sort. And that's how work orders and documents and photos that you tie to your assets are able to maintain that connection. Okay, thank you, Sue. Uh, one more question. This question is from Ron and he asked, if sewer lines are TV'd, could we attach a picture or a video? Yeah, so uh, document management is a big part of asset management. We actually, that that photo that I showed of uh, the Sandy Hurricane, the treatment plant that was flooded, the sewer collection system for that client. Uh, they service 26,000 uh, customers. They are in the process now of CCTVing and tying CCTVing to their assets in GIS. So it's a manhole to manhole CCTV AVI file that gets tied down to the actual pipe location. So when you click on the pipe, you're able to open that uh, video and run it. So the one thing that uh, you have to remember, uh, whatever device you're using to view that when you click on the pipe and look at a video, or maybe it's an AutoCAD file that's connected to something, you have to have that program on the device you're accessing it with, otherwise it's not gonna be able to open it. Um, I think uh, I'll ask this last question. This question is from uh, Andrew, and he asked, can a system be used for pavement management? Most certainly. So uh, pavement management can be done in many different ways. You can have boots on the ground, somebody with, or several people with iPads, and they're filling out those forms on the condition assessments of pavement, or you can do mobile LIDAR, drive, uh, drive the roads, GPR and mobile LIDAR and do a collection of uh, cracks and uh, ruts and things like that and push that back into your GIS and have a visual on areas that require in-depth, uh, more in-depth uh, research on them. Okay, thank you. I think that will conclude our Q&A session. Um, I'll just turn it back over to you, Sue, for any last final final comments or remarks. Sure. So I'm available. My email is there. If anyone wants to talk further or has, uh, you know, some services they're interested in, we could definitely uh, get on a screen share and talk further. And I do thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, I find these very useful. I've been attending a lot of uh, webinars as well myself. So enjoy the rest of your week and stay safe. Thank you.